after finishing the single table, you want to take now expressions and you want to take all the control flow and iterative constructs. So we generate three address code and the technique we are going to use is still the same, which is uh, using syntax directly translation. And what we have to do now is that as I process, say, a rule, which is a grammar rule of this form, I simultaneously want to generate code for this state. So first let's understand how we are going to generate code for this and I introduce now few more attributes for this and again I'm going to use subscript which will try to differentiate between E and E1 and E2 so that these are same symbols but we have different properties. So one thing I would like to know now is that if you recall when we were generating three address code when I wrote something like this and suppose I say A is sign x plus y plus z, we want to write three address code for this, we were generating certain temporaries. So we said t1 is going to be x plus y and t2 is going to be t1 plus z and then a is going to be assigned t2. Is a kind of code we finally want to come up with. So as I am going through this process of parsing, simultaneously I want to generate this code. Now well, there are two, three things we need to understand here. One, that if you look at these variables t1 and t2, okay, these are temporary variables which have been generated by the compiler. So that means I must have some function which can generate now temporary names for me. This is one thing you have to remember. Second thing that when I pass this particular string which is x plus y, okay. I am going to put it in a temporary name and then when I am going to parse this and this together, then I am going to put that value into another temporary name. That means I must remember where each of these expressions is being stored. Okay. So that is the temporary name I must remember and therefore I must also have some attribute for Otherwise, I will not be able to get it code. Okay. And the next thing I have to do is that I must remember what are the code sequences I have generated so far. Okay. Because finally, I am generating code and I am saying this is the code corresponding to this. So I must remember what is the code sequence for this, what is the code sequence for this, and then what is the code sequence of this, and what is the code sequence corresponding to this. Okay. So I must also have some attribute for code. Okay. Anything else I need to have? Any info, any other information I require? For generating code other than these attributes. At this point of time, it looks like that as far as straight line code is concerned, I don't require anything else. Now, assuming that I have all these attributes available to me, then what is the kind of code I will generate for this? So let's with all these attitudes and this example, let's see that if I just have a grammar rule like this and I am reducing by the right hand side and I am reducing it to E, what kind of rules I need? Any, any ideas? Let's look at what we have written here. Okay. Once again, we are able to do it, then we will be able to see that generalization is going to be much easier. So what is the code sequence for this? Okay. So let's look at this code sequence. Okay. Now, as I said, so first thing I must remember is that I have some attribute which is saying that I must remember where E1 is stored and where E2 is stored, some place. Okay. So that means I have some attribute which says E1 place and some attribute which says E2 place, which will give me name of the variables which says that where expression corresponding to E1 has been stored and expression corresponding to E2 has been stored. Right. Next thing I will have to do is, once I know these places, I will have to generate a temporary name corresponding to this okay, and say that these two variables are added and stored in that particular location. Okay. So the way I can write my code is I can say that E place is a new term. So suppose I make a function call without any argument which says that E place is going to be stored into the temporary name 
I have generated. Okay, and then I will say that what is the code corresponding to E? So if I look at the complete code sequence corresponding to this particular tree, so look at a parse tree like this that I have some nodes which are hanging like this. This is how my parse tree is going to be. Okay. So now if I say what is the code corresponding to E, how will I write that attribute? And so if I say it is E1 code, very good, concatenated with E2 code, anything else I need to do? So I must generate now one instruction which will say that do this addition. Okay. So that means the next instruction is going to be that I am going to now generate which will say that E place is E1 place plus E2 place. Oh, oh, sorry. So, first thing I said was I am going to generate a temporary name. Then I am going to say that I am going to have E code which is same as E1 code followed by E2 code followed by generating a new instruction which is saying that E place is assigned E1 place plus Now what happens here? So look at this once again. Okay? That now suppose I am parsing x and y, okay. Then if I just parse this sub expression using this rule, what will happen? First thing I will say is a new temp corresponding to E. So, what will be the new temp? It will generate T1 and then it will generate an instruction saying E1 code and E2 code. Now, what is E1 code and E2 code when I am just parsing this? Nothing, it is just a variable, so no code has been generated. And then I will generate this instruction which will say T1 is assigned E1 place and where is E1? That is in X and what is E2? That is in Y. So I will end up generating an instruction which will say that T1 is assigned X plus Y and that value will be stored in E code. Okay. Now when I parse this whole thing, again I will say that I generate a new term. So I generate T2 and then I will say E1 code. Now what is code corresponding to this? That code is? the instruction I just generated and what is the code corresponding to this? Null and then I will generate one more instruction that will say T2 is assigned T1 plus Z. Right? So it will generate these two instructions on the right hand side. Similarly, if I want to write now rule for saying that I have a statement. So if I say that my rule is something like this, that ID is assigned an expression then what is the kind of code sequence I get for this now. So let us look at this and try to write rule for this particular grammar rule. So what are my attribute tools here? So I am now trying to figure out what my S code is and do I need a place for S? Yes. Do I need a place attribute for S? I don't require any place because that's a statement. That is the final thing. Okay. So what is my S code in this case? Give me rules now, and you have all the examples in front of you. So how will S code look? So all I need to say is this is E code concatenated with one more instruction I need to generate. And what is that one more instruction I need to generate? I need to generate which will say that ID place is assigned to this. Right. So now if you see the third instruction which is being generated, that will be passed by this particular rule. E has already been passed, the value of that is 
already stored in P2. So I generate the last instruction which will say that ID places this and E code is already stored these two instructions which is E1 being assigned X plus Y and P2 being assigned T1 plus Z. That is already available to E code. Will I get all the information here? Yes, no. Okay. Now suppose I write a new rule which says E goes to E star E. So I'm now changing my operator. Okay, if I change the operator, then what will I get? So now tell me what are the rules I write for this? It's same as the first one, except that operator will change from addition to multiplication. Right? There's no other difference. So is it making sense now? How we are generating pre-address code? Okay. So let's now go through. Once we have understood this part, let's go through the generation of pre-address code. This is how the code will look. That if I am saying so, we are already familiar with what pre-address code is. So I'm not repeating that part. Okay. So when I have a grammar rule which says id is assigned e, then I'm saying s code is nothing but e code followed by this instruction. And if I have a rule which says e goes to e1 plus e2, that means I am taking two expressions and adding them. Then I will say that first I have to make a call to new temp to generate a temporary where this expression will be stored. And then I will say e code is nothing but e1 code followed by e2 code followed by generating an inst instruction. Okay. And if I say I have multiplication, then it will be repeated except that this plus will get replaced by a multiplication. Clear? Are you confident now that given straight line expressions or any kind of expressions with no control flow, no loop, nothing, okay, I can at least write systematically pre address code. Okay. Now let's add a few more rules. Okay. So now suppose I have a rule like saying that E is a bracketed expression. What are the attribute equations for this? So E code is equal to, so let, let's change this. So what will I write? I have two attributes which I have to initialize, place and code. So what will be E code and what will be E place in terms of E1 attributes? So E code will be just E1 code and E place will be E1 place. Okay. And what about this? generate another instruction first or I just can carry all the instructions I have generated so far and that will be sufficient. I need to generate one more instruction. That means if I need to generate one more instruction, that means I need now a new temp. Okay? So first thing I will say is that E place is a new temp and then I will say that E code is E1 code followed by a new instruction which will say that E place is minus E1 place. It's a unary negation. So this is how my code will look. E places new temp and E code is E1 code followed by generation of new instruction to say E place is minus E1 place. just take on all the expressions now. So you can see that I have taken care of all the assignments. I have taken care of all the arithmetic operators. You need to just elaborate it on all possible operators and then I can do it on negation okay. and then I can just do it for bracketed expression and I can do it for ID and in case of ID I am not generating any code but I am just popping the case value. So all expressions are done. Okay, for all expressions now, I can write here this code. Okay, expressions which involve mathematical operators. Okay. So here is an example. 
and if we try to write it, now suppose I am just parsing it, I am not trying to use DAG or I am not, not trying to even optimize number of calculations that we handle at some other point of time, maybe later. Okay. Suppose I need to generate now code for this by parsing all the rules. What is the kind of code I will end up generating? First, you can see that if I am scanning my input from left to right, A assignment will be generated end and then first this unary C will have to be taken because this has a higher precedence. Okay. So, this will have the highest precedence, then the multiplication will come, then this B star minus C will be evaluated, this B star minus C will be evaluated and then addition will happen and then assignment will happen. Okay. So, I will end up generating code like P1 is being assigned minus C and then P2 is being assigned B star P1. So, that gives me value of this sub expression. I need to do the same thing here. So, as I said, I am not optimizing temporaries here at this point of time. So, I will now say P3 is minus C and P4 is B star P3, which gives me value of this sub expression. Then I need to add the 2 and put that in a new temporary, which will say P5 is P2 plus P4, and then I will say A is assigned to P1. That's the kind of three address code I will end up generating for this particular expression. Clear? Any questions on this? So, this looks fairly straightforward as far as generation of free address code for expression systems. Any, any complexity which is involved, something which is not clear, anything. Because this is something you are going to heavily use in all your projects. You need to do code generation and you need to understand <coughs> all the rules there. Okay? Now let us come to flow of control. So, if straight line expressions are clear, then I need to worry about flow of control. Okay. Now, what are the flow of control statements I have? I have if, I have if then else, okay. and then I will introduce iteration. But let us see first conditionals. Okay. Now, to generate code for conditionals, only thing I need to understand is <coughs> that what is the semantics of each of the statements. So, for example, if I say a rule which is of this form. Suppose I have a statement which says if expression then statement. Okay. Simplest possible case. Okay. So again I want to distinguish between this S on the left and S on the right because they have different attributes. Okay. And E is a Boolean expression, and for this, for the time being, what I'm going to assume is that I have some method of getting for Boolean expression. Okay. I'll not worry about how do I do that? I will treat that as a black box for the time being. But only thing I need to remember is that when code for this has been generated, what is the place where this value has been stored? Because I need to go and compare. So, when I say place, what that means is there is some temporary in which value of Boolean expression is stored, and then I need to compare that for two or false. Okay. So, how will code for this look? Semantically, what does it mean? Semantically, what it means is that first I will generate code for E, then I will check whether this is true or false. If this is true, then I will go and execute this code, and if this is false, then I will jump to some label which is beginning of the next statement. Right? Okay. So now, only way, only thing I need to know is therefore not worry about code, code can be systematically generated. If you know the semantics of this particular statement, then you can very easily do that. So, first you will say is that I have some E code that has to be generated. So, let me write straight away S code. Okay. So, this is what my S code is going to be that first I must have code for E. Okay. Now, once I have code for E, okay, then what is the next thing I need to do? I must check it for true or false. Now, where is the value of the C code stored? That is in E place. Okay. So now I need to generate one instruction which will say that if E place is equal to E place is equal to true, then what will happen? Then code for S1. So can I do it other way around and say that if this is false, then jump to some label. If this is true, then it will just fall through and execute code of S1. Right? 
So if this is false, okay, then go to and where do I go? After S1. And what is that after S1? I need to have an address, I need to have a label where I can jump. That means now I need one more function. Earlier I was generating only temporaries. Now I also need to generate labels. Okay. So now let me say that I also generate labels. So let me say that L1 is a new label. Okay. A new label is some function I have introduced, which will give me from a pool of labels. We keep saying that there is a label. Label. Right. So now I'll say that let's jump to L1. Okay. But if this value is true, then what do I do? Then I go and execute S1 code. Now, assuming that S1 is straight line code, it has no control flow. But even if it has control flow, I can always recursively generate code for this. And all I need to say is that this is S, S1 code. Okay. And after that, what do I need to do? I need to generate a label. Okay. After all, that is where the control is going to be. So I need to now generate one more instruction, and I will say that generate now L1, this label. Right? Now, does it semantically translate what I have captured here? Okay. So this is really what happens in control of code. Okay. Uh, okay, I started actually with a different example. So since I started with while example, let's also work that out. Or let me skip that part and first go to. So I started with iteration. Let uh, let me skip this part. Okay, so here is if then here is actually a more general case of if then, which is if then else. Okay, so what will happen in this case? I have two statements here. One is S1 and another is S2, and depending on whether this value is true or false, I will either execute S1 or S2. Okay. Now, how this code, which I have just shown, and this code, these two things are going to be different. Don't tell me the difference. Everything else is going to be different. Uh, after label, you have S5 code. So, not after label, but instead of label. So, now you have to see two things. Okay. That if I say that if this is true, then depending on that, I'll either jump on this or jump on this. Now, depending on whether you compare it with 0 or 1, one will be a fall through statement, another will be a jump. Right? So you need to have one more label for either then or else part, depending upon whether you compare this with 0 or 1. And then I need to have one more label which will take me out of this statement. Right? I need two labels there. Okay? So that's the only difference that will happen. It will say that if this is false, then I'm going to a label which is corresponding to else part, which is S2. And if otherwise, it will just fall through and execute S1. I don't require a label for that. Okay? And if S1 gets executed, then where do I go? Should I just fall through or jump somewhere? Then I must jump after the statement S. Okay? So I need a label there, which is corresponding to this L1. And therefore, I need to have a statement which will say, jump to a label which is after S, and then I'll say I have a label which is corresponding to S else, where I jump here, and then I have code for S2, and then what do I have? Do I have one more instruction for jump? No, it will just fall through, right? So then I'll have this only for S after. Can somebody just switch off the lights? There's a switch just outside the door. At least this light will be slightly brighter. Yeah. For some reason, <coughs> this collector is not displaying colors as it should. So this is how the schema will look. And if I now say that this is how the schema is looking, then there are two labels which are being generated, and I need to make calls to these two labels. Okay, so what are these labels? These are 
I will say that SLC is now a new label and S after is a new label. So, these are two new labels I have generated and then I will say S code is nothing but E code followed by this statement which will say that if E place is 0 then I jump to this label then I will have code corresponding to S1 then I will generate now one more instruction which will say jump to S after then I will generate this label and then I will generate code for S2 and then I will generate this label S after. <coughs> This takes care of both. So when we are generating S dot after, uh, so whatever statement will occur after that, won't we be repeating that in the first time? When we generate code for that statement. So what will you repeat? Good question. But what will you repeat? I'm only generating a label, not a full statement, right? No, you are still not complete with your question, or you are not articulate. So it is an issue which we are sort of raised but we are not able to clearly articulate. So what happens, okay, so let me rephrase the question. Now what happens if the statement immediately after this has a label in the beginning? What will happen in that case? So suppose, so <laughs> let me go back and just for, wait for one slide and then we will rediscuss this issue. So let us go back to what we just skipped and which was a while statement. Okay. Um, yeah. Let us look at while okay. and then I will uh, address this issue which we just raised. Okay. Now how do I generate code for while statement? Okay. Now again what is, it, what is the schema, what is the semantics for this? Okay. That first I must generate code for this okay. and if this is true then I jump and execute S1. After S1, what do I do? I need to jump back to the beginning of while statement and re evaluate E1. Right? And I keep on doing it. And when E1 becomes false, then I jump to statement which is immediately after S. So how many labels do I need? Two labels, one for the beginning of the statement, another for the end of the statement. Right? So this is how the schema looks that I'll have a label at the beginning, then I'll have code for E, and then I'll say that if this is false, then jump to S after, otherwise I will say execute S1 and then I will jump to S beginning. So I will just go to this and then I will have a label S after. Okay. And if I now write it in terms of code, how will it look? It will look something like saying that I must generate a new label corresponding to this and I must generate another label corresponding to this. So two labels must be generated and then I will say that S code is now just this schema which is generating a label begin then it has code for E. So I still do not know how to expand the code for E but I am assuming that this part has already been processed. So when we look at Boolean expressions this part will become clear and then I generate this instruction which says if E place is 0 then I jump to S after and then I have code corresponding to S1 and then I have code which is corresponding to this jump and then I have generation of <coughs> label itself. Okay. Now suppose after if then else statement, next statement is y. Okay. So I am generating one label in if then else statement which says go to the beginning of the next statement and I am generating another label which is part of this y which is taking me to the beginning. So what happens if if then else is followed by y? Do I have two labels for the beginning of a while statement? Yes, we will have two labels, right? So if then else statement will generate a label, but when control comes to this label, there is no executable corresponding to that, so it will fall to the next label. That will work, okay? But that is very inefficient. We do not want to waste number of labels. Another issue is that when you are talking of labels, suppose I need to generate machine code and not assembly code. See, if you are generating assembly code, then labels are nothing but symbolic names. You have done assembler? You have read something about assembler? Yes, no. So how do I determine, suppose I am assembling this program, I am generating machine code, how do I find out address of the label? So if I say here, go to S after, okay, what is this address 
go to S after, do I know this address at this point of time? If I am not using symbolic name, okay, but suppose I am assembling this, okay, this is now assembly code. Okay, and I say jump to S after, what is the PC value of S after? Do I know it at this point of time? Yes, no. Why do I not know it? What prevents me from knowing it at this point of time? I don't know how much code is involved in S1, right? <laughs> it's recursive definition. So when I'm passing this, I do not know how many instructions are going to be taken here. So when I say repeat in beginning of every class, please turn off your mobile phones and so on. Isn't that an understood protocol when you enter a class or more a lecture? So if I do not know the address of this, okay, when do I fill in this address? I will know this address only after I have generated all this code, right? These are PC values. That means what will happen is that this place will have to be left actually blank. Okay. That you will not fill in this, and this will be filled in afterwards after I have determined value of this label, and we are going to use a technique called backpatching. Okay. So if I start using backpatching, then you will find that this problem of multiple labels will just vanish. But in this key, when I am not doing backpatching, it's a two-pass assembly or two-pass code generation, then I generate all kind of redundancy. Clear? Yeah. Is your question now answered? Okay. So these are two flow of control statements we have okay, that we can handle while now I am not going to do repeat until and so on because once you have understood schema for one iteration, rest of the iterations are going to be just replication of the same thing. And once you have understood schema for if then else, then all conditionals are going to be same except one which is case statement which I will handle slightly different because case statements are special and they are not just if then else. Okay. Now, what will happen is that in the simple table, I am putting names now. So two instructions earlier which I had generated, I will now modify it and say that when I was, so first when I wrote this and I said e code is nothing but id place, okay. how do I know what my id place is? I have already entered that in simple table, so I will just, I can do a lookup and find out that what this id place is. So basically this is returning me a pointer. So if I am just saying return a pointer to this, I do not have to have a name for this okay? and a pointer will be sufficient and then we will say that <coughs> if this is not null, that means this value has already been entered in the simple table, then I am going to emit this particular code. Okay? If it is null, that means variable does not exist in the simple table, then I am going to give an error. Okay? Similarly, when I say E goes to ID, so these are the two places where I need to access my simple table. If E goes to ID, all I need to do is look up this ID and if this id has not null and I say e places p, otherwise this is an error. Okay? So this is the only additional thing I need to do now, I need to check whether this value is already in the simple table. Because I do not know when I start parsing, okay? the value may not be there at all. Okay? Now next thing that comes is arrays. Okay? So I have handled simple variables, okay? but what, what happens in arrays? Arrays have certain properties which are different than variables. Okay? And one property arrays have is that all array elements are going to be given consecutive locations in memory. Okay? That means when I write something like so if I have a declaration like in A10, okay, what this means is are two things. One that I am going to now allocate 10 elements which are going to be indexed by 0 to 9 if I am talking of C and depending on language the index values may change. But more importantly, I will say that I am now reserving certain space in memory which will have 10 locations, so 3, 7 and you can put 3. Okay? So this is going to be A0, A1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. These 10 locations are being developed. Okay. So, 
I will not say that A0 is, so my map is not going to be something like saying, if this is my memory that A0 is here, then A1 comes here, and then A2 comes here. Okay. This is not what is used. Okay. I have always have consecutive locations. Okay. Now, if I have consecutive locations for all array elements in memory, then do I need to know the addresses of each of these variables? I don't have. Only thing I need to know is that what is my base address, from where the storage <laughs> starts, and what is my index value. Okay. This two are sufficient to find out. So in simple table, I am only going to store the base address. Okay, and whenever I say that I am trying to access AI, only thing I need to know is I, and I need to know my base address, and then I can do this computation. Okay. Now this part of this computation has to be pre-computed and stored in the simple table for code generation. Okay, so what will happen is that arrays are going to be stored in a block of consecutive locations, which are like this. And assume that width of each element is double. That means from the type information, I know that how many bytes each of these elements is taking. So if I say this is an integer array and each integer is given four bytes, then I know that it is taking 40 bytes. Right? That gives me the total address which is required. Okay? Now when I say that I want to find ith element, all this is saying is that I need to know my base address plus I need to know what is the lower index. Now, Depending on the language, it could be 0, it could be 1, or there are languages which will say that, which will permit me to have declarations which will say A is 10 to 90. That is also perfect. Right? So, I'm giving you a more general expression, and which is saying that I must know the lower index value. So, if I know i and I know the lower index value, then ith element can be found by saying take the base address find out the difference and multiply it by w. Now you can see clearly that if it is 0, then the base address, so for example, if I want to know the base address of i, then I just need to have 9 here, and this will just vanish, so this will give me 36 base plus 36, right? Okay. So that is what will happen, that base <coughs> is the relevant uh, relative address of a low, okay? So depending on the language, you will have to find what your low value is. And if I now take this expression, okay, and sort of do some algebraic delivery and reorganize it. Okay. You can see that there is a constant part, okay, which is base minus low into W, and there is a part which is dependent on I, and I can write it in this form. Now, this constant base minus low into W, okay, this can be pre-computed and can also be stored in the single table. Okay. I do not have to compute it every time. If I say that I want to find out AI or address of AI, I do not have to compute this part and I can just access this because then only thing I need to compute <coughs> is this particular multiplication and this addition. Okay. That is going to save me. Again, time it is going to give me more efficient. Okay. Now, if I go to two dimension arrays, okay, problem becomes slightly more complex okay, and then we we'll <coughs> generalize it for n dimension arrays. So, if I go for two dimension arrays and I say that I have now, so let us not worry about languages like C, where arrays are going to be handled by pointers, but let us take a situation like this. Okay. And I say that there is a two-dimension array which is going to be mapped down to memory. Okay. First question that comes is that if this is my array, how do I map it on to what is the order in which I am going to pick up elements from this particular array? What is the <coughs> element order in which I will pick up? Can I randomly pick up these? Obviously, no. Then do I go in this direction or I go in this direction? And why in this direction? Either you are going to have row major storage or you are going to have column major storage. Fortran has a column major storage, C has a row major, Pascal and C has all kinds of languages that row major storage. Okay. So if you take a Fortran array, that is how it is going to be stored. So this is called column major and row major is going to be that I will take elements in this direction and will keep the storage. Okay. Now obviously you can see that access patterns are going to be different. 
because I am not assuming square arrays, okay. These two dimensions could be different, okay. So, access pattern depending upon whether this is row major or column major is going to be there, okay. That means I will still start with my base address here, okay. And suppose I say that I want to access this particular element which is aij, okay. Now, to find out aij, that means if this is giving me the row number and this is giving me the column number, okay, I need to find out how many rows are before that, okay, and multiply that by number of elements, okay, and then that will take me to this base address. Then I say that how many columns are previous to that, okay, that is the computation I need to do to find out the base address of the right, okay. So, this is what happens the storage can either be row major or column major depending upon the language you have. And in case of 2D array stored in row major, okay, so for all of major you can do this computation, okay, address of AI1, AI2 or AIJ can be calculated in this form, which says that base, okay, and then I will say that this is giving me the row number minus whatever is the low index of I multiplied by number of elements in each row, which means number of columns are there, okay. So, you have to see very clearly that when I am saying I am computing this, I will say how many rows are before that and multiply that by number of columns. So, n2 gives me number of columns I have, okay. And then I say that for the second part, I will take i2 minus low 2, which is giving me then this offset and multiply whole thing by w. And what is w? Number of bytes each element is going to take and add that to the base address, right? State expression again I can reorganize this okay. So, n2 is just give me column numbers and if I rewrite this expression this is how this expression will look and you can see that this part of the expression is constant and this part is the only one which depends upon i1 and i2. So, after simplification you can see that this expression can be pre computed and can also be stored in the simple way okay. So, this is I will say that this is a constant part, constant value which is part of the symbol table. So, to find out the address of a i 1 i 2, this is the expression I like to compute every time, okay. This is the kind of code I like to generate. So, if I now say that and this you can now expand to all n dimensions and also you can expand it to that instead of row major if I have column major then you just need to change this particular expression, right, okay. So, this is doable, I mean this is simple 6, 7 plus, <coughs> I mean much more complex than that. So, as code generation what will you do that if I say that A is some array which is 10 by 20 and I want to find out, so N1 is 10 elements, N2 are 20 elements and I assume that <coughs> W is 4 which means each element takes 4 bytes, okay. And I want to access A, Y, Z. So, y and z are two indices, okay. This is how my code will look, okay. I will say that t1 is y star 20. So, this is basically this part is the one which corresponds to computation of y and z, and this part is t3. When I say t3, this is really computing this constant. So, I do not know what this a is. This a will be, when will I know this a? So, when will I know this a? At what point of time this is <coughs> computed or is known to me? When I put memory allocation, right? So, whenever I say that array A is going to be stored in some memory, then I will know the base address of A and that also is in the symbol table. So, I can then just compute this part, okay, and then I can add <coughs> and generate code. So, you can see that this expression is not being computed every time I am writing code for A by <coughs> so This is the only change. So, there is a 3 address code for computing array. So, only difference between a variable and array is going to be that arrays are going to have consecutive locations and therefore, given an index value, you will have to find address of each of the elements. For all other variables, addresses in the symbol table. Clear? Any questions on this? Okay. So, now let us look at one more thing. Okay. And if you recall at some point of time, we started doing type checking and type coercion, okay. And when you are doing type coercion at that point of time, I wrote code in certain manner. So, if you recall, I said that when we have code in this form and then I said if this is int and this is int, then type of this is int. 
and if this is float and this is float then type of this is float and if this is int and this is float then I wrote one expression by doing a kind of type internal type equation okay. So, same thing now in terms of code generation what will happen that if I am now trying to generate code and I say mixing of types is allowed that means E1 and E2 could be of different types but they obviously need to be valid types as far as this expression is concerned okay. Then the way I have to generate code is now I will check that if E type is integer and E2 type is integer then I am going to emit code which will say that E place is now assign E1 place plus integer addition and E2 place and type is going to be integer. So, now you can see that I am mixing type checking along with the code generation okay and this is the reason if you recall I said that rather than clubbing it in just two clauses we are saying if both are integer then this is integer else this is real okay I expanded this into four separate cases okay. So, this is what happens here okay and similarly if both are real then the same thing can be get done but if two are not the same one is integer and another is real then what will happen then I will have to do type casting which is internal coercion. So, what do I do now for type casting now you can see that if this is integer and this is real that means E1 has to be type casted to now real ok. So, for this I now need a new temporary variable and I say that I am going to emit now a code which will say that u is signed into real which is the function to type cast E1 place ok. So, this integer has now been type cast into real and then I will say that E place is nothing but u and real addition and E2 place. So, one more instruction for type casting has to be now generated ok and then I will say E type is real. Now, what will happen when this is real and this is integer ok. I just need to <coughs> flick the order here and say that it will be E1 place and u will be into real of E2 place ok. So, I just need to change the order and I will get similar source code for this. So, now you can see that when it comes to real type checking in code generation ok it is not sufficient to say that I will have just two clauses but I need to expand it in full four clauses and for each case I need to generate the code and this is also ensuring that I am generating the right kind of <coughs> operation here. So, in this case I will generate integer addition and in this case I will generate real addition and in all other cases actually I will generate real addition ok. But in this case I am also generating now an implicit type casting instruction ok. Yeah. Any questions on this? saying that I am allowed to mix only type of integer and real, but if you say that I have a type hierarchy ok and I can convert from any lower type to any higher type then I need to have all those uh, simplicity type conversions. No, I mean your question is not answered I know and this is something for example both are expressions one is of one type another is of another type you need to generate the proper type casting in the function there. Right. So, if I am only as I said my language is assuming that E1 and E2 are only of type integer and real. Now, suppose you say that I can convert an integer to character and I need a type casting function for that it is also an expression. So, so that is a restriction which is imposed by the language not by the compiler compiler is just implementing whatever language is saying. So, if my language says I am only allowed to mix integer and real then I am doing this if you say that I am allowed to mix all these 10 types then I just need to expand all these cases that is the only thing I do ok. So, let us take a break here today and all those who did not collect their answer scripts in the previous class you can just come and collect from me.